Vault 19 is found northeast of Good Springs, beneath an abandoned parking lot, the inhabitants of which, as lucky as they were to have survived the Great War, soon found themselves at the mercy of vault Tech. Upon entering the vault, the survivors met with their overseers. Vault 19 is unique in that it had two of them, each of whom would govern their own half of the vault. As such, the dwellers were parted into two equal groups and taken to one of two sectors, red or blue. From there on, their contact with the other group was extremely limited, and the contact they did have was brief, perhaps sharing a table in the cantina or passing in the hallway, which gave them a few moments to communicate. Other than that, they tended to keep to their own sector, befriending those they could actually spend time with and as time went on, these small interactions slowly faded into nothing, with both groups all but ignoring the other. After a few months of being segregated, the overseers sent a message, the same message to both groups. It said there was a problem with one of their water purification filters. The problem would be fixed, but until it was, they were to keep their water usage to a minimum and to report to the clinic if they felt ill. Now Vault 19 was constructed inside, or at least partly inside, of a sulfur cave. And that sulfur might have damaged the water filters. So this message from the overseers could be genuine, although it probably wasn't. Now one of the Reds, having read the message, felt as though something was off. Intrigued, he started to ask other Reds if they knew anything about the filters but none of them could think of a reason as to why the filters would fail. They were built to last, so the damage must have been intentional. And right on cue, the Red heard a rumor from one of his neighbors that the Reds themselves were the ones responsible for the damage, which didn't surprise him, as whenever he walked by a group of them in the cafeteria, they all started to whisper, probably plotting their next move. But why had they broken the filters? It affected the entire vault, not just the reds, but also the blues too. Speaking of, one of the blues had been reading the bulletin board for many weeks, and over that time, a pattern had formed among the pages. A code of some sort. Someone was using the board to communicate. One of the reds, pretending to be a blue? He didn't know, but for whatever reason, they wanted him to see it. These two inhabitants weren't the only ones having strange encounters. Another red, specifically a child, was hearing noises coming through the intercom. A really high-pitched sound that sometimes mimicked a human voice. But the child's parents heard no such thing and told him it was just his imagination and to keep quiet, as the others would only worry. But the strangest thing about the voice was the other children could hear it too. And these strange encounters continued, with one blue having noticed that the lights beyond the red's hallway flickered in a way that wasn't normal. From what he could tell, it was Morse code, an SOS. Was it a genuine call for help or a trap? Either way, it worried him. Then the voices started, with one blue thinking that someone was actually inside his head as sometimes he heard thoughts that weren't his own. So the Reds must have done something to the intercom system, rigged it somehow to broadcast into his brain. However, the Reds had also started hearing voices, and this time, it wasn't just the children. They could hear multiple voices talking through the vents at night. It could only be the Blues talking about them, since they never sat with them in the cafeteria. They treat the Reds like they had a disease. Maybe they did. And perhaps the thought of the Reds carrying some sort of sickness was keeping the Blues up at night, as one of them was having trouble sleeping. At around 1.30 in the morning, while reading, the Blue discovered the vent above his bed started pushing out more air than usual. It lasted for around 5 minutes, the room took on this foul smell, and then the vent went back to normal. He didn't think much of it at the time, but then he had trouble sleeping the next night too. And at 1.30, it happened again, and he soon realized that this happened every single night. Was the lack of sleep playing tricks on his mind, or was it the Reds pumping something into his room while he supposedly slept? 
Rumors had it they had sabotaged the filters, so this could be their work too. Whatever the cause, the Blue hadn't slept all week, and now he was having headaches because of the poison coming from the vents. And he wasn't the only one. Another Blue, his neighbor, had also noticed the additional air added to his room each night. So together, the two Blues reported the issue to the maintenance officer, who said the system was running perfectly and there was nothing to worry about, but they didn't trust him. Maybe the system was running perfectly, the way he wanted it to. Was he a red, pretending to be a blue? Anything was possible. However, there were certain reds that also couldn't sleep. While they hadn't noticed the strange air coming from the vents, they had seen someone late at night, a blue, creeping around their security door, trying to get in. Was he a friendly spy or a deadly assassin? Like I said, anything was possible. Several days later, while in the cafeteria, a blue was having his daily sunset sarsaparilla when he found something unusual. Before anyone else had the chance to see what it was, he ran back to his room for a closer look. On the underside of the bottle cap was a blue star. Were the reds behind it? Was this a part of their mind control? They must be making him see things, things that shouldn't be there. The star shouldn't be there, so why did he see a star? No matter how long he closed his eyes, it wouldn't go away. The Reds had finally got to him. Despite keeping the bottle cap close to his chest, another Blue had noticed his strange behavior. He knew he was hiding something, a message from the Reds maybe. So later that day, he broke into his room and there on the table was the bottle cap with the Blue Star. He didn't know what it meant, but suspected that his neighbor had been marked for something and for whatever strange reason, he wanted that bottle cap. And perhaps others did too. Because not long after, the Red's overseer was actually seen walking around on their floor. He was searching for something and mumbling to himself. It's safe to say that something wasn't right in Vault 19. Messages in the lights, voices in the vents, thoughts that weren't their own, a foul smell, and now a strange bottle cap. Could things get any worse? Yes, yes they could. Because the Blues, terrified of being poisoned by the Reds, had gone to the clinic in search of a cure, which they didn't find. But during their visit, they realized that the doctor never left her office. She had all of her meals brought to her, and there were even guards standing outside her office during all hours. Simply put, she was hiding something, and it was about time they found out what. Luckily, one of the Blues was a computer whiz, and he was able to use one of their terminals to see what was on the doctor's computer. And what he found were patient files from a facility outside the vault. The names of the patients were all in code, but the descriptions seemed to fit people inside the vault. Some of the Reds, but also some of the Blues too. These patients had gone to the doctor seeking treatment for panic attacks or trouble sleeping, Others claimed they heard voices taunting them. It all felt a little too familiar for their liking. They couldn't be these patients, could they? Surely they would remember going to the facility, but it must be true. Why else would the doctor have bodyguards, her food delivered, and isolate herself from the rest of the vault? It was to ensure that she remained safe, protected from her patients, from them. The Blues don't know why they can't remember their time at the facility, so it must be the doctor doing something to them. Maybe she's drugging them. They don't know, but they do know that they need to get inside her office and see what's going on. It took some doing, but a few Blues got together and managed to distract the doctor and her guards long enough for one of them to enter the back room and look around. Inside, he found restraints and enough sedatives to kill a horse. The doctor was tying them up and drugging them to make them forget who they were. They were just pawns in her sick game. Well, enough was enough. They confronted her, but she refused to give them any information and they were quite literally thrown out of the clinic. They tried talking to their overseer, the blue overseer, but he acted as if he didn't know anything about it. Meanwhile, the Reds heard about the Blues causing trouble at the clinic and at first, they thought the Blues were stealing chems to poison them while they slept, as they too had discovered their rooms were filled with something foul each night. But then they realized 
that maybe there was a bit more to it. The commotion was a trick, and the doctor was actually giving the blues chems. She was in on it, and the reason she never left her office was because it was the only place safe from the poison. So now the Reds didn't trust the doctor either. They may have tried talking to their overseer, the Red Overseer, to see what he thought about the situation, but his answer would have been the same as the Blue Overseer, because both overseers were, after all, equals. Or were they? Well, inside the Red Overseer's office, we can find his terminal. Although the machine is broken, there is some cut content, journal entries that reveal just how little he knew about Vault 19. Inside the first entry, we learn that each night, a few hours after falling asleep, the Red Overseer is disturbed by this strange noise, a mechanical sound like something being pushed. Then, what he can only describe is the sound of an elevator. Now, the Red Overseer says that he's seen the blueprints of the vault, and there's no way an elevator could actually be where the sound is coming from. And even if there was, there's nowhere for it to go. Yet, despite knowing this, he found himself walking around the blue sector, somewhere he definitely shouldn't be, in the hopes of finding something. Now, he knows it was wrong, but it was the middle of the night, and the chances of someone seeing him were incredibly low. Besides, even if someone did see him, it would be good for the experiment. And someone did see him, sneaking around the hallway, mumbling to himself, although instead of searching for the Blue Star bottle cap like they may have thought, he was actually trying to find the source of the mysterious sound. Inside the second entry, we learn that the Red Overseer no longer fully trusts the Blue Overseer, and he wonders if they were given different orders. Maybe the noises were just in his head, a side effect of the experiment. But just in case they weren't, he's going to write to the Blue Overseer to get some answers, after which he hopes he'll finally be able to have a good night's sleep. Now inside the Blue Overseer's office is a terminal that actually works, and with it we can learn that the medical records in the doctor's office were fake and that Vault 19 was made to test different ways to induce paranoia through non-violent and non-chemical means, which I will come back to in just a moment. Furthermore, we learn that a group of technicians have been assigned to run the reactor, and they are currently researching methods to improve said reactor, the floor of which is fully staffed and completely self-sustained, and the only access between the vault proper and the reactor level is through the hidden elevator beneath his desk. Sadly, some of the data is corrupt, but we are left to assume that the Red Overseer isn't privy to the research happening at the reactor, which is why he doesn't have his own elevator, or is even aware the Blue Overseer has one, which was the mysterious sound he was hearing each night. The only other diary found within Vault 19 that I haven't mentioned already is the one belonging to a technician working on the reactor. And in his diary, he says that he has a bad feeling about something, as if they weren't alone down there, and has even started hearing weird noises coming from above his room, which was either the sounds of reds and blues living in the vault above him, or intentional noises made to induce paranoia, because the technicians were also subjects in the experiment. There's also a third reason for the noises, and they were the sounds of the fire geckos and night stalkers living in the sulfur cave. However, there is no evidence to say they were present at the time of the experiment, only that after 200 years they now call the cave home. So, we know the experiment was to induce paranoia through non-violent and non-chemical means, and they did this with subliminal messages, blinking lights, strange voices, limited water, the possibility of getting sick, among many other methods. And after living in these conditions for several months, the inhabitants had grown so fearful of everything around them that even a special bottle cap was enough for a man to lose his mind. In the end, we don't really know what happened to those living inside of Vault 19. We are led to believe they went insane from the experiment and killed each other, another depressing tale brought to you by Vault Tech. Yet, there's something missing. If they really did kill each other, then where's the evidence? The bloodstains, the weapons, the bodies, and the messages left by those who survived. There isn't anything like that in Vault 19, 
and they didn't just vanish, so they must have found a way to open the vault door and escape. And this theory is supported by the fact that many years later, escaped convicts were able to access the vault. It's worth noting that Vault 19 actually has two entrances, the main door beneath the parking lot and the other entrance inside the Sulphur Cave. However, the only way into the vault proper from the Sulphur Cave is through the Blue Overseer's elevator, and that's locked, which means the Blue Overseer most likely retreated to the reactor level when the red and blue groups started working together. But this door being locked also means the escaped convicts couldn't have come this way. Instead, they must have walked through the vault's main door, which the inhabitants left open on their way out. As for those inside the reactor level, the Blue Overseer and the technicians, they could have either left through the other entrance or they stayed behind. And if they did, then there would be remains, but we don't find any. So maybe the wildlife consumed their remains, which is a bit of a stretch, but entirely possible. In a twisted form of irony, the convicts now mirror the original experiment, with each leader taking an office and both groups slowly growing suspicious of the other. While the experiment is long forgotten, the smell of sulfur from the cave is still getting inside the vault, and perhaps that smell had a bigger effect on the residents than vault Tech anticipated. The smell of which made the residents paranoid. They fully believed they were being poisoned, and maybe they were, as repeated odor events may culminate in real symptoms, such as headaches, fatigue, and nausea. Nevertheless, the sulfur can be considered a chemical means to induce paranoia, so the entire experiment, due to the vault's unusual location, was a complete and utter failure from the very start. Be sure to show your support by liking the video and subscribing if you haven't already for more Fallout content. If there's anything you'd like to see in a later video, leave a comment and I'll see what I can do. With that said, thank you, as always, for watching, and I'll see you in the next adventure.